everybody. Uh, welcome once again to another One Thing. I'm your host, Neil Bauer, and I'm joined, as always, by the lovely Kim and Jody from ePayments. Ow. <laughs> uh, this week, we actually have two guests on One Thing. It's the first time we've ever done that. Thank you both for taking time out to join us today. Your, uh, the film Fish and Men launches September 14th. Uh, you can pre-order it now on iTunes and on Amazon. We'll have links for everything down below, but I'd like to introduce everybody to the directors and producers of Fish and Men, Darby Duffin and Adam Jones. Welcome to the table, gentlemen. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, let's start, because on my, my screen it goes Darby and Adam. So Darby, can you give us a little bit of your path to this documentary? Yeah, so I started my career working in um, motion picture film and development for six or seven years in Los Angeles, then um, dusted off a communications degree, moved back east, was working in communications and PR, you know, for the last 10 years or so. Um, and then I had started my own company on a mission media to sort of combine that background where, you know, I was using the uh, the storytelling uh, skills that I had from in, in the communication skills from both you know my film experience to develop content for clients. So I shoot um, documentaries, mini docs for for brands and corporations, and um, uh, and now feature docs with Fish and Men. So there you have it. Um, I uh, my first job out of out of college was a production assistant on a TV commercial. And um, from there, I, I, I discovered the art department where you get to decorate sets and build sets and see what things look like through the lens of a camera and what you can create. And then from there, I started directing about the turn of the century. And so for 20 years or so, I've been directing TV commercials and branded content for, um, for, for brands all around the world. And I've been fortunate to have, you know, be able to practice my craft in a lot of different places with a lot of different people and always kind of be directing, which that's one cool thing about commercials as opposed to features. It's like, if you're a feature director, you might direct something once every three years, but I get to be on set a lot. I've been on set since I got out of college and um, I thought, well, yeah, let's make a feature. You know, that's, and that's, that's just another format. What's, what's the big deal? You know, if I can make something 30, 60 seconds long, well, it's 85 minutes and uh, boy, it's a different beast. It's a real different piece. So this was this was a complete rebirth when it comes to my journey as a filmmaker. Now I feel like I can look myself in the mirror and say I'm an actual filmmaker, but it's only taken 20 years. Wow. <laughs> You're understating your work, both of you. Uh, I've actually seen, you can check out uh, Darby Duffin at onamissionmedia.com. You can check out Adam Jones's work on adamrichardjones.com. Again, I'd like, like to give a shout out to my website designer as well. Guy's a drunk. Neil you know, Bauer graphics, man. <laughs> All right. Great, great <laughs> Just looking at the cinematography, I mean, I know that's what you guys do, but like some of those you could, you know, you said Jody's thing, you could take and make them into stills and come out with a whole line of pictures or something. It was a rare occasion on shoots where we had actual DPs, which Adam and I are not, but. Oh, wow. We, yeah, so we kind of shot at least half the movie ourselves. But uh, we yeah, have the help two of, thirds. Yeah, I mean. Not to take any credit away from Derek McCain and John Millman, our DPs on the film, who donated so much of their time and skill and art to. For sure. Uh, the, the days that we actually did have DPs. I'm sure those are the shots you're referring to. <laughs> well, yeah. like a lot of the fishing stuff, I mean, all of it, in fact, we didn't have a DP. Yeah. Um, wow. So, you know, a lot of those really pretty color sunrise, sunset shots. I mean, that was just Adam and I. Wow. Um, that whole day. That's impressive. And then, um, you know, I went out a couple of times by myself, um, David Gaithel, and then uh, I don't know if you guys have all seen it, but then, the, you know, the shots at the end of the movie we use, um, you know, and usually that was just because I, you get little to no notice. You get a call the night before, hey, we're going out. You know, it's February, it's, you know, Tuesday morning at 4 a.m. You know, really, you know, it's the night before there's, you know, not much you can do except start, pack, you know, start charging your batteries. So, yeah, we, we, we do have a fair amount of shots that we, let's just say outsourced. Um, but the, it, I, will say, I will say learning how to 
curate the stock footage that you use is an art form almost unto itself and and making and i think between shutterstock getty i i stock every stock darby and i have searched and looked at every single fishing related anything that the keyword fish is in the search term shot that every one of those libraries have and uh, so yeah there was that was a part of it i mean we just had to be really, really selective about about how we used them and where we put them. And that was, you know, when we started off talking about how long this took, Neil, that was a big part of it. You know, uh, I remember when um, we're thinking about organizing shoots, one of them was, well, well, we have to go to Asia, right? We have to be able to get some of this footage. Uh, that, that was a tough one. Uh, that took a lot of research and we found somebody that had actually gone over there and, and done it. And, uh, cause I had threatened Adam, I was just going to go to China and probably end up in a Chinese prison somewhere and <laughs> locked up the have to just, he'd have to promote the movie without me. But that would have been promotion in itself. You would have been, you should have got yourself caned because that puts you right <laughs> on top of the news. Right. It's not too late. Yeah. I could. <laughs> I'll cane you right now. Yeah, <laughs> it gets me hits. So that hey, you know what? That's a perfect segue into my question that I have. My one thing. So, you guys did a ton of travel for this. It looked like I mean, you were talking about going to China, but you did go to Norway. You did spend a lot of time in the Northeast. A lot of the people that watch this are where they're in different industries or sideways industry, but they do travel a ton. So. When you are traveling so much, what is the number one thing you need to do when someone says like, hey, you need to be on the boat tomorrow morning or, hey, we're going to be out for 72 hours in like in the next day or so. Get your ass out here. What's the number one thing in regards to balancing family obligations and travel <laughs> when this, something like that pops up? Yeah. Balance all that. I mean, I, I, I can start this, I'm sure. It's, it, it actually opens a, a door to a much larger question of, of like, how does one make a documentary? I mean, that's almost what you're asking because the, the, balance, the, the idea of just going out on a moment's notice, you know, the, these, this film was made in over a seven year period, but you know, I, I, use the, I use the metaphor, it was like a baseball game. It was like, you know, there's moments of play in between lots of stillness. But over that time, that's that, and these things would come up spur of the moment and we would have to, you know, get up and go. But our families had to sort of be okay with it. <laughs> and they're, okay. it's, it's, the, it's not just the amount of time, but it's the amount of, um, even of our own money that that we're spending to to do this, so it's it's kind of like, how do you deal with the spur of the moment thing? Is is a bigger question. Is like, how does one self fund and self produce a, a feature length documentary? With the the answer is we just did it all ourselves, and we tried not to, you know, be bad husbands and dads at the same time. It's, it's a tough, it's a tough answer. Um, I think we had unrealistic expectations early on. I think we thought we could get this film out. Um, we shot the bulk of it in two years and then off and on for the next year and a half or so. So I think by the end of 2016, we were pretty much done shooting, but all along the way, you know, we were, as Adam said, you know, paying for it out of our own pocket. And that, I certainly didn't realize, you know, how deep we would be digging into our own pockets, nor how expensive it would get as much as we were able to sort of, you know, keep the budgets tight. You know, I think we initially thought 250,000, that seemed like a lot, you know, unbelievably, you know, like, how are we going to do that? If we knew that at the beginning, we just, we would have walked away. You Probably know? would have walked so, away in a year. And having that film done enough to where you could submit it. And then, you know, these cycles come up and you got a window. And if you want to go to Sundance, it's, you got to get a submission. in. that was the other big learning curve. Um, I'll let Adam take it from there. But what, what we thought the film was done, I think in 2016, he can talk about these private screenings um, and what, you know, what wake up that was yeah. what a reality check that was for us. That was, that was one of the darkest days <laughs> we had, uh, we had, I had paid for me to fly and sit with an editor for like two weeks in New York city, a guy that I knew 
through advertising circles who had agreed to work for a favor rate. And I sat, you know, until three in the morning, night after night, getting it ready for what we thought was going to be our Tribeca Film Festival submission. And this was like, our, we're, we're, we're putting all our eggs in this basket. <laughs> and so then my friend in Los Angeles uh, says, you know, you, have you test screened it yet? You know, I'll, I'll do one for you if you want. Cause it, and so I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure it's awesome. You know, I don't know why we really need a test screening, but sure. So I, so we, no, I wasn't like that, but I was like, of course, let's do it. So he puts this group of like kind of heavy hitter doc documentary and filmmaker types and people in the industry, mostly insiders in a room in his living room. And it was about a dozen people and we watched the movie. And then afterwards they just proceeded to eviscerate everything that we had done. I mean, um, after I had gotten back from New York and I just, I remember, and Darby was on the phone and I was there and I just remember I stayed up that night, just like trying to, trying to figure out like how, how I could have been so far off, you, you know, and that was 2000, December, 2016. And after that night, when we thought we were done, ready for the world, we edited for another 18 months. Wow. Wow. 18 months, full-time editor. Forget about how much that is per day. You know, I think, you know, in these ways, this is how we grew as filmmakers through, through this process. Like we, we, we had to earn our stripes that. You that know, was definitely the low point. Yeah. Was, I, 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 remember I was ready to throw in the towel after that night. I really was. Yeah. Well, was, you, was, you sound like entrepreneurs. <laughs> well, and I was going to say that's a great lead into my question because just listening to what you've shared, um, what you've had to endure and the patience and, and what you went through, what is the one thing you would tell people to keep them, keep them motivated, keep going? Like, how do you do that day in, day out? It's like anything in life. You're, you're either going to give up or you're going to persevere no matter what. Right. And at that point, we had invested so much, you know, not just money, but time and energy and, you know, the emotion. Friends and family. Yeah. 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 That it was like, the, I mean, you know, it's, I personally, I, it's funny because I didn't take the, the critique. I wasn't there facing it. So, I mean, I give out them the credit for <laughs> taking the bullets, the, the hailfire of bullets. Um, but it's, you know, it gave me a step back. So I'm, I'm listening to it. And, but there were, you know, these guys were going this direction, that direction, and you can easily get taken off what your vision is, your objective. And you're listening to people that have, you know, made and sold documentaries before. And, you know, here we are first time filmmakers started off with a vision, wouldn't be here, you know, if we didn't have one, but then, you know, that's where you have to really believe in what it is you're doing and what you're going after. It doesn't mean you don't have, you don't make, you don't listen, you don't make adjustments. You don't like Adam said, you know, maybe there's some actionable advice here, but you don't go and like start reshooting, you know, where does this end? You know, <laughs> I love that. So. That, that kind of leads me into my question, which I have a, kind of a two-part question for both of you in a sense. Um, you had said that you had an unexpected conversation with a fisherman's wife that haunted you for two years. You know, a lot of people, I'm an emphatic person, a lot of people have empathy, but I would like to know what about that conversation haunted you to the point where you and Adam, because I know you went a lot of different directions before the two of you sat down to that lunch and mm -hmm. said, yeah, let's do it. Despite the fact that making this film required more perseverance, patience, and sacrifice than I ever imagined, this film extracted every ounce of ingenuity, energy, and adaptability that I could muster. So it was a chance meeting I had. Um, we were actually looking for houses, my wife and I, and, um, it's, you know, when you're looking for houses, you're not usually having these long conversations or certainly personal ones. And this ended up kind of being one of those. And so I, it just was unexpected. Um, and she was obviously, you know, I could see the emotion and the personal cost it had. So I ended up doing some pro bono work with her. Um, and, you know, I, I, that's when I kind of began to see for the first time what the real, um, you know, conditions uh, were like for an industry that I thought was doing just fine. Um, you know, and so <clears throat> it was that 
And then I was, you know, I, there was a local fish market I used to go to. And then I was like, oh, this is so, you know, now I'm looking, you know, um, with a different perspective and I'm, I'm noticing that, you know, there's no local seafood or very little, you know, and you can literally see the boats, fishing boats um, from this particular market. And so uh, for me, it was, that was the light bulb that went off. It was like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. I mean, these takes a lot to get that inertia going. Like what, you know, you have a story, but then like, how do you, you know, where do you start? And um, so that was sort of the emphasis for me to kind of put, put the concept down on paper, pitch it, see how it did. And then, you know, believe in it enough to go. Yeah. And it was accessible. This story is incredibly like from the get go, I wasn't prepared for the emotional level. Like I followed this for years. I was part of that Indiegogo campaign. Like I, that's where I first got vested. I mean, I, Adam had talked about it before, but you watch the trailer that's emotionally charged, but the show right out of the gate where the guy's talking about an Edmund Fitzgerald type event where he's like, he got rescued. He got pulled out teenager, yeah. like 20 something, six, two pulled out of the water. I'm like, I'm not going to make it through this thing. Yeah. Like, what's the thing you do to remain emotionally impartial or to remove that from the equation? I don't, I don't know that you want to remove your emotion from it. I mean, I think you, you mentioned the opening scene. Let me just comment on that real quick because starting the movie editorially speaking, narratively speaking, was the most difficult part of the edit. And we probably tried eight, maybe eight different opens, Darby. Um, and that scene was, was during the day. It was during the day that we went out for 18 hours on the boat. I was seasick. I got seasick that day. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been seasick to play. I have, yes. And there's oh, nowhere awful. to go. And the yeah. sea will not stop moving ever. <laughs> and, and Darby also awful. got a little seasick, but he muscled through it. He was up in the wheelhouse with that dude, Russell Sherman, the captain. And he sat there and rolled on him for like three hours straight, just talking. And I was curled up in a fetal position near the engine room because it was warm. And he got this story from Russell about what, what happened to him that time. And we had it, we had it, um, we use it on a voice on, we, we, you see him tell the story a couple of times, but it was, a, it was it's the audio mostly that we use. And Dar Darby was like, you know, let's try it here. Let's try it here. Like, we kept moving that scene and we, were, and we kept, because all the footage that you see in that open too, that's another one of those like very, very carefully curated uses of stock footage mixed because we didn't have any imagery to go with that, you know? And that was my thing. I was like, how are we going to connote the imagery that goes with him telling the story? It can't just be him stand, you know, yeah. Head yeah. and open the film. And so it really became this kind of really, it was very difficult because like I said, we tried seven things before it, but Darby was super persistent about like, this is the way this, this story has to be in the movie. And we're like, well, if it's not going to be in the open, I don't know where to put this thing, you, you know? And so then once we like are also, let's, let's give a shout out to Heidi Zimmerman, our editor, because she took that conversation that him telling that story was like 47 minutes long or something. Right. And after pass, after pass, after pass, she, she got it down as tight as you see it in the open. And then I was combing through stock and I, I actually I actually did a few effect shots. Like there's a scene where there's a, the, the raindrops are going bird's eye down on a boat to show them floating by themselves. Like that, that's like four layers of stuff in there. Like I found a boat layer, it was a still, I put the people in it. I found a rain alpha channel on Shutterstock that was coming down. And like, so we built these, these images to sort of just, connote what, what what was going on and and um we've gotten so many comments on the way that it started because because we're hooking you emotionally right out of the gate and then trying to segue into the material that we're talking about which is you know the cod fishing situation so um i think you know not to blather on and on but the, but the real challenge to this was that we realized that the that the arc of the gloucester fisherman is not necessarily going to have a happy ending it's it's kind yeah. of like on a downward trajectory and there's really no way to, to fix that. So that doesn't really make for a good film. So what we had to do is like, we knew that that was the heart, the beating heart of the film where the, was Gloucester and the, and the fisherman in particular. And he lived. And he lived. lived. <laughs> so, he lived to tell the story. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, the open, right? It's critical. You got to get hooked in that first two minutes. Um, yeah, I, I felt, you know, very passionate about that being the how we get you in because you got to get them in emotionally. And but, you know, to Adam's point, it was a um, it was a tough edit to get there. But um, I mean, my original pitch for this was Deadliest Catch Meets Food Inc. So I'd always wanted to incorporate some kind of the danger of that job, of that profession, right? It's, it's, you know, one or two of the most dangerous jobs you can have. And that sort of story just takes you there, tells you that immediately. And like you said, Neil, you, you instantly realize that and have a whole new profound admiration for what these guys do. We don't think about that. What we knew the challenge was going to, this was a very informational type of film we have so much to throw at you informationally, but at the same time, the real challenge was, you know, how do we, how do we involve the audience, make them care about these characters? So we were always trying to find moments where we could develop character, you know, make the audience care in between, you know, what we're trying to give you informationally. Uh, so I think we finally found that happy balance in the film, but it took a long time. And like you were saying, the the layers of that, I actually thought there were you found some footage with the freaking Coast Guard or whatever. It was so well. That was an amazing find. Yeah. You know, and I, I liked Adam's response to where he talked about, you know, uh, how do you as a filmmaker um, take your emotion out? And it's yeah, I agree. You, you you can't, but I will say this in terms of like one that hit me hard in the gut. And I, I know it did for Adam too. And I know when when we were in the middle of this interview in my head and i think he was thinking the same i knew immediately like this we have a film like this is going to be a, we have something here and that was the interview with rich burgess and of course we 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 use that in our many iterations of trailers rich's reaction um but it was that interview which i think was i think that might have actually been our first interview adam but when we walked out of there, out of Rich's house that day, and we had a couple other interviews more to do that day, but, you know, I looked at Adam and, and I was like, yeah, basically it's on. Cause that, you know, was what you can't, um, you can't make that happen. You know, you, you, you hope that's what you get in all these interviews, but the reality, the, you know, the stark reality of a, of a grown man, a middle-aged grown man, you know, showing you that kind of emotion up close and personal was, um, for me, I knew like, yeah, we, we just might have something here. You absolutely do. Because that yeah, you said from the very start where that, that, that you had to say seven different, maybe iterations of the intro, that intro was perfect, but leading into those fishermen story, it's like one after another, like the outrageousness of the situation, like the absolute, like everybody's going through it in some way or shape or form, whether it be through an economy or a shifting, you know, pandemic rules or whatever. Everybody's like, why am I at the behest of these ever changing, like slide whistle, of in, like incomprehensible rules that I have no idea what's going on. Like everybody deals with that. But these guys are, their entire livelihoods, generations are being impacted by, by this. Yeah, that's why I was saying, that's where that question comes from is that, I was outraged 10 minutes into the movie. Yeah. I'm like, how do you guys go seven years and like not be like. And we were tempted uh, along yeah. the ways, I think, uh, you know, to find a villain, right? Um, you know, who's your antagonist? You know, we would get this question, you know, where's, you know, is it, is it the government? Um, and is it John Bullard? You know, I mean, that was sort of the most obvious choice. Um, you know, we had a lot of conversations about this topic, uh, Adam and I. And, you know, we were hesitant to do that. Um, you know, at the same time, we wanted to show the animosity, the clear animosity between these two forces. Um, but, you know, I think where we landed and what, where you come from or where you come to is, is much more accurate, which is really, you know, the system. It's the system, you know, it's the globalization of this industry that, you know, this is, this is where we've come to. And I, I don't know if Adam wants to, to, 
to chime in on that, but it's an important point because it was one that we wrestled with for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Just, we didn't, we didn't want to, um, we didn't want to vilify any person or thing because everybody had, every stakeholder has their own perspective on the issue, but it was easy to vilify the, the globalization of the industry. So we just blame it on China. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Those fish farms were awful. Like the freaking, what is that, MC Escher painting? Ass yeah. That. Like, that's freaking. What makes you want to go get a tilapia sandwich, huh? No. <laughs> no. Stick uh, with that barrel fish, Kimberly. Yeah, yeah I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs>